series. I'm your zoology teacher, Mr. Rippa, coming to you from room 227. Uh, today, we're going to move on to lesson two. We're going to talk about some classification within the echinoderm phylum. And we'll end up talking in a little bit more detail about the class that the sea stars are in. And that will cover today's material. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So today we are into lesson two on the echinoderms. And we're going to start talking about their classification. So what we have is the breakdown. Again, this is zoology. So we are kingdom animalia. And uh, we are in phylum echinodermata. And we have uh, in phylum echinodermata subphylum pelmatozoa. But uh, I'm not really going to hold you responsible for the subphylum. But what we are going to talk about are the different classes that we find in phylum echinodermata. And one of these classes we will talk about in a little more detail. The others will just list what we find in those classes. So the first is class Crinoidea. Those are the sea lilies and feather stars. Uh, so here is a sea lily and a feather star down here at the bottom. And they are filter feeders, which means uh, they just sit there and they filter some microscopic organisms out of the water. And that is what they eat. So um, they're not very active. They stay in one spot and they let their food come to them. Next, we have class Asteroidea. These are the sea stars. This is what we're going to spend uh, a lot of our time discussing. And so we'll have more on these guys here in just a little bit. Next, we have class Concentricloidea. That one's a, a mouthful. These are the sea daisies. And as you can tell, they get their name because they do kind of resemble uh, a field of daisies, daisies, of the flowers. And they are also sessile. They stay in one spot and they will also catch their food as it drifts by, similar to the sea lilies, another name for another flower, and the feather stars. Next, we have class Ophroidea. These are the brittle stars, and the brittle stars get their name because of their fragile appearance. You can see their arms are very thin. So here's their central portion of their body, and the arms that extend out from that body portion are very thin, and it gives them a very brittle or fragile appearance and that is how they got their name as the brittle stars next is class echinoidea these are sea urchins and sand dollars most of us if we've been to the beach are familiar with sand dollars these brown sand dollars are the living sand dollars if they are bleached out white then they are the dead sand dollars and what you're looking at is their uh, calcified endoskeleton, the ossicles of their endoskeleton left over. And here we have the spiny sea urchins, and they are basically small mobile pincushions. Um, they have all those spines to help protect them and keep their underbelly nice and safe. And they just cruise around and, and eat. Uh, they're decomposers. They'll eat whatever happens to be lying uh, on the ocean floor. And then uh, the ever-popular Holothoroidea. These are the sea cucumbers, and they're very slow-moving decomposers that just trudge along on the bottom. And you can see what they got there, how they got their name. Um, they have a very cucumber kind of shape. All right, so let's go back to talk a little bit about the uh, class Asteroidea. Again, these are the sea stars. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about them. They demonstrate the basic features of echinoderm structure and function. So that's why they are a good example. They are regularly found along the shoreline on rocks or sandy bottom and found on the coral reef. 
and they can be found uh, in any and all of the oceans. They are found up in the Arctic, where it's extremely cold. Uh, they're found in the tropical regions. Uh, you can find members of class Asteroidea just about anywhere in the ocean. They are varied in size. Some species are very small. Many times they are brightly colored. And they can be anywhere from a centimeter in diameter to a meter. And as if you know anything about the metric system, a meter is 100 centimeters. So here we see some pretty good uh, representatives of those. So there's one barely on the fingertip there. And here's one that clearly is much bigger. So they do range greatly in size. They have a and show pentamerous symmetry. Um, again, pentamerous meaning uh, pentagon or pentagram with five points. So if you look at the planes through the body of a sea star, and I kind of put the black dots there so that you can count them. So this would be plane one all the way through, plane two all the way through, plane three, four, and five. You can divide this organism into five equal right and left portions. And that's what pentamerous symmetry means. It can be divided along five axis and planes to get um, equal right and left halves. Beneath the epidermis is an endoskeleton of small calcareous plates known as ossicles. This gives the sea star a spiny surface, which is how it got its name. The phylum echinodermata means spiny skinned. And here we can see the uh, all of the tissue of uh, this sun star has been removed. And all that's left over are the bony or the calcareous ossicles or plates. And that is the basic endoskeleton of that, of that creature. The umbilical grooves run down the bottom. The, this is a sea star that's been flipped over. And they run along the bottom of each of the arms and form the central mouth on the underside of the animal. So here is its mouth right there. And we'll get back to uh, its mouth when we talk about its feeding. Uh, but its mouth is very centrally located right in the center of all five of the arms. And there are thousands and thousands of what are called tube feet that project from those grooves. And we'll talk a little bit about tube feet uh, here shortly. Um, covering all, all over the top of the sea star, um, we have spiny grooves called pedicellaria, which means, the translation means tiny pinchers. Um, these pincers help keep the body surface free of debris, protecting the dermal branchiae or the skin gills. And if we remember, those, that's what they use to breathe, the dermal branchiae. And you can see here, there is a very tiny, this is the spine, the, you know, the, that calcified ossicle that makes the spine. And here's that tiny little pincher. And so if the animal uh, has sand that is thrown on it, you know, from whatever a fish swims by and some sand gets on top, these little pinchers will grab the individual grain of sand and pass it to the next pincher and uncover, remove all the sand from the animal's body, keeping it clean on its surface. Also at the top is an inconspicuous anus and the circular madreporite. So its anus is on top of its body, so which kind of would make sense. So when it does eliminate waste, it's eliminated from up here and can get rid of it easier than if it's down underneath. And besides, its mouth is down there. So, you know, you don't want that. Um, and then we have what is called the madreporite. The madreporite is the sieve for the water vascular system. This is how water gets into its body and allows it to move. They, they move by using water pressure. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly. But this little spot right there, and you can see this is just a diagram of their water vascular system. 
This is the intake valve. That's how water is drawn into this whole system. The water vascular system is a coelomic compartment unique to echinoderms. And remember, a coelom from our vocab terms is a true body cavity. So this water vascular system uh, is found within the body cavity of the organism. It functions in locomotion and food gathering as well as respiration and excretion. It is the heart of the echinoderm. It is everything. The, the water vascular system is used for a lot of its life processes. The water vascular system, abbreviated here as WVS, opens to the outside through the pores in the madreporite. Again, that is that intake valve right there. That leads to the stone canal. The stone canal runs down here to this ring known as the ring canal. And the ring canal will have branches called the radial canal that run down each of the arms of the sea star. Then there will be very small tubes called Tideman's bodies that will come out and connect to these tube feet. And all of these are tube feet. And this bulb of the tube feet is called the ampullae. And we'll talk about how that works here in just a minute. Attached to the radial canal are the small lateral canals that connect to the tube feet or the podia. So, so we don't watch a YouTube video on this YouTube video. I won't click this link, but I will embed this link um, in the Schoology announcement so that you can go back and watch this instead of watching a video that's embedded within a video. Uh, but it, this video shows how sea stars will feed, and I'll describe it very quickly. Here we see there's a clam right there, and what happens is the sea star climbs over the clam, and using its tube feet, it attaches to the shell of the clam, and with the water vascular system, it just keeps pumping water into the system, and if you've ever seen a fire hose, when it fills with water pressure, it straightens out. So the tube feet are suctioned onto this clamshell. It runs water through the arms, which causes the arms to want to go straight out, uh, similar to a pressurized fire hose, and that pulls on the clamshell. The clam has two pair of muscles, or has two muscles, a pair of muscles, that hold the shell together. And those muscles will fatigue after a while, and the clam will slowly, as, it, as those muscles tire, the clam will open, and when the clam shell opens, the sea star then uh, forces its stomach out of its mouth and it digests the inside of the clam while it's inside its shell. It eats the clam. It dissolves the clam in the shell, absorbs that material and nutrients in its stomach while its stomach is in the clam shell. And then after the inside of the clam, all of the soft tissue inside the shell is gone, then the sea star simply brings its stomach back into its body and goes to look for its next meal. Uh, pretty terrifying for a clam, if you think about it. Uh, once the sea star wraps around it, uh, it's, it's pretty well doomed. And that's what you'll see in the video. All right, that will probably be enough for today's lesson. So let's go ahead and end it right here. All right, that'll conclude today's video lesson. Uh, if we are on remote, uh, you will now be directed to go to Schoology and take your exit slip for this lesson. And if you are on quarantine, then hopefully you've taken good enough notes and you, this will give you what you need for this section of the lecture material. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you later.